Hello and welcome to Invertebrate Paleontology and Paleobotany at Utah State University. This is lecture 12. We'll answer the question, what is punctuated equilibrium? Now, punctuated equilibrium is one of the most misunderstood concepts in evolution. In this lecture, I hope to give you a greater sense of what this concept is about and how it is manifest in the fossil record. First, I'll talk about the origin of the hypothesis or idea and then how it was rigorously tested in using the fossil record. And finally, it's, its general acceptance as a theory. I'll also talk about the mechanism behind punctuated equilibrium that explains the patterns observed in the fossil record. Punctuated equilibrium was born out of the ideas presented in the book Tempo and Mode of Evolution by G.G. Simpson, published in 1944. Simpson presented an idea of what's called an adaptive landscape. The idea of an adaptive landscape is that plants and animals are ideally suited to their environment. These are the points of highest fitness. They occupy niches and habitats that allow them to breed and reproduce and to continue to exist in the environment. As such, the plants and animals don't necessarily need to change because such changes would decrease their fitness. Natural selection keeps the population from changing by pruning out individuals which exhibit variation that is detrimental to the survival of the individual and which might decrease its reproductive fitness. Hence the population exhibits little change over time. But what happens when the environment changes? Well, to avoid going extinct, species need to adapt to the new environment or new ecological factors that threaten their survival. Simpson suggested that the rates of evolution can then go into hyperdrive during these periods of stress. But for much of a species' existence in the fossil record, they're happy not to change significantly. A change in form or morphology would be detrimental to the survival, making them less optimal. Thus, Simpson argued that evolution was not a gradual transition, but a process of jerks and stops. Two young graduate students began to test this idea of evolutionary rates by examining the fossil record in detail during their PhD dissertation research at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. Both students studied under the same mentor, the well-known and well-respected invertebrate paleontologist Dr. Norman Newell. Now before I go on, I have to tell you this shocking story of meeting Dr. Newell uh, when I worked at the American Museum. Um, at the time, uh, Dr. Newell was in his mid-90s. He was in a wheelchair. He was nearly blind and hard of hearing. But he had still come into his office like every day um, with the help of his wife, and he had work on research. This is a man who got his PhD in 1933 from Yale. So it's a testament to his passion of paleontology that he kept working far past his retirement. One day I was helping his wife and him move a bunch of old computer monitors out of his office, and I accidentally stuck my finger into one of the slots in the back of the old monitor and it had built up an electric charge and I got like shocked big time. My hair went all frizzy and I, I actually felt a little faint. But what I also remember about Dr. Noel was the large geological map of Gondwana land in his office. This is a continent that he helped uncover during his work in mapping the biostratigraphic ranges of invertebrate fossils from South America and North America from the Permian period. Um, and so this is like meeting someone who had discovered a lost continent buried in the sediments. And as such, it was, it was a bit like meeting a modern day Christopher Columbus. In any case, two of Dr. Noel's graduate students at the museum, Niles Eldridge and Stephen Jay Gould, were working on their PhD dissertations. Eldridge was studying trilobites, while Gould was studying land, the land snail from Bermuda. Um, both Eldridge and Gould had collected sufficient fossils across different stratigraphic horizons that they could look at changes and attempt to measure the rate of evolution. What they both discovered was that fossils exhibit a pattern of stasis, no change, but then a quick shift would occur in the rocks when a new species would appear. And this pattern is one of the reasons biostratigraphy is so useful to geologists because rocks are demarcated by seemingly quick changes in species. 1972, Eldridge and Gould published a chapter in an edited book called Models in Paleobiology. The chapter begins with an editorial introduction by Thomas Schroep. Schroep, who later started the journal Paleobiology, states what Eldridge and Gould proposed is, um, in fact, nothing really new. Paleontologists had previously discovered this pattern in evolution of stasis 
and sudden appearances. And actually, he cites the work of the French invertebrate paleontologist Felix Bernard, who wrote about patterns of evolution in 1895 in his book Elements de Paleongie. Now, Felix Bernard has the most succulent explanation for this pattern. Species in one bed often differ wildly from the preceding, even when there is no stratigraphic gap between them. This, he states, is easily explained. The production of new forms usually takes place in a narrow, limited regions in the periphery. The diversity having once occurred, the new types spread often to great distances and may be found near the present form without breeding with it or presenting a trans trace of transition. This is the pattern you'd expect if speciation is primarily in small, reproductively isolated populations as suggested by the genetic fruit fly work of Theodore Dubansky or the research of Ernst Meyer. Hence, the fossil record frequently misses out on evolution of new forms that occurs in the back alleys. So it's rare that the rock record captures these processes. Instead, what we see is that species appear distinct and that changes occur in jumps. Now, it's important to mention that these transitions in the fossil record demonstrate transitional forms but these transitions are spaced in the rock record in periods of stasis, or equilibrium, and jumps, punctuation. It does not mean that species appear fully formed, but morphological innervation proceeds through long periods of stasis and short periods of change. What Eldridge and Gould argued in their chapter was that people were still clinging to the idea that evolution is gradual. Hence, the title of their chapter was Punctuated Equilibrium, an Alternative to Phyletic Gradualism. By naming this phenomenon in the observed pattern of the fossil record, Eldridge and Kuhl called attention to the misrepresentation of the fossil record in textbooks and in the media as something that occurred gradually. Stephen Jay Gould was a debater, a fact finder, a modern bulldog for evolution. He had a vernacular language that would terrify people. Well, Eldridge is more of a laid-back, pragmatic student of evolution and less confrontational. They made an odd couple, and toward the end of Gould's life, the two fought bitterly, but they highly respected each other, a bit like brothers. Much more of a debater and always eager for a fight with Stephen Jay Gould. They, there were two people that really ignited Stephen Jay Gould into arguments and debates. I once sat through an hour-long lecture in which Gould expounded his disgust upon one man, Rudolf Zenglinger. Now, you likely recognize the work of Rudolf Zenglinger. Zenglinger painted the famous dinosaur murals at the Peabody Museum in New Haven, which were reproduced in Life magazine. Zenglinger was an artist without much of a background in paleontology, but he was, he was drawn to the story of evolution. And the story he was asked to paint was the evolution of man, and in 1965, he painted a series of early human ancestors along a timeline for a fold-out page in a Time Life book called Early Man. The book was widely read by the public, and the image of a march of progress highly influenced people's ideas of evolution as the gradual, stepwise acquisition of traits. Next to Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa, and Edward Mook's The Scream, I really don't know of many other artwork that's been so well replicated. The March of Progress has been laffooned and replicated and made fun of. It's become an icon of our shared culture, and Gould hated it. The March of Progress showed the gradual evolution of man, not the bushy mess of fossils, not the peripheral populations, the species that went extinct, the dead ends, the shifting populations, but the linear progression, often with the end result of the modern suited man or the later forms would invoke the image of woman. It was a particularly strong image of a society's view of evolution in the 1960s, that we were headed somewhere. Hence, Gould had a visceral desire to familiarize people with the complexity of evolution, not the linear directionality of it. So what do you think? How do you view evolution before watching this video? Now, the second person that Stephen Jay Gould debated in various scientific papers was the mammalian paleontologist Philip D. Gingrich. Philip D. Gingrich was a professor at the University of Michigan. Now, Gingrich, shortly after Eldridge and Gould's original paper appeared, published a study of a small mammal called Hyopsidus. 
Gingrich followed up with some additional fossils of mammals from the Willwood Formation in northern Wyoming in the Bighorn Basin. Using a few hundred specimens, Gingrich measured the molar teeth of these fossilized mammals and showed a pattern of gradual diversification. So you have a sort of small size population and it gradually then splits into you know, smaller and larger forms higher up in the, in the stratigraphy. Gingrich referred to this as stratophonetics. This is where you measure a trait across stratigraphic horizons to see how it changes with time. Now Gingrich even proposed a unit of measurement, a Darwin for the rates of morphological change. The evidence seemed to contradict the fossil evidence that Gould and Eldridge had assembled. Was this an example of phyletic gradualism? In 1977, Gould and Eldridge took on this claim as well as others. They stated that the following had to hold true to prove phyletic gradualism occurring in the fossil record. First, new species must arise from the transformation of an ancestral population into its modified descendants. Second, this process of transformation is even and slow. Third, this transformation between ancestor and descendant involves the entire population. And fourth, the transformation from one species into another species is played out over the entire geographic range of the ancestral species. So to do this, you need the following. You need first a really, really good, especially dense stratigraphic fossil record. If you have two points, for example, it doesn't mean that they are connected by a straight line. You have uh, many data points. You have to have many data points across all strata to show gradual evolution. Two, you need an especially long, temporally long fossil record. Gradual evolution would be would mean that it, it happens over long periods of time, so you need a long fossil record. Third, a wide geographic occurrence of fossils. Remember that if you're arguing that evolution happens within the entire population gradually, you need to sample the wider geographic range of the species. Otherwise, you might be sampling one of these peripheral populations. Now, this is not impossible, but this does put the share of finding evidence for gradual evolution onto paleontologists to get more fossils, to do more higher resolution studies and sampling new formations and new locations. In the case of Hyopsis, the evidence started to grow as more fossils were discovered measured and placed within the stratigraphic framework. Gingrich's gradual lines slowly shifted as the total extent of each stratigraphic population was sampled. In 1994, Thomas Bound, a researcher then at the USGS, measured thousands of teeth of Hyopsis from the Willwood Formation, the same unit Gingrich had sampled. The new study documented distinct shifts that occur at distinct horizons, where, there are, where there's a distributed shift in the size of these species. These breaks are clear jumps in evolution that were not discernible until more fossils were sampled and the denser cluster of fossils examined in detail. Gingrich's example of gradual evolution began to crumble under the weight of thousands of fossils. However, note that there does appear to be some shifts that appear gradual in the higher strata. Well, the test would be to see if these slight shifts can be discerned in other basins, or if this represents a rare view in a peripheral population in transition. In sum, the observed pattern of punctuated equilibrium in the fossil record strongly suggests that evolution occurs in the periphery in small isolated populations, and hence parapatric speciation dominates. Only with considerable detailed fossil record can we recognize these transitions in the fossil record. It's really, really important to state that punctuated equilibrium is a theory within paleontology that fully supports the notion of the evolution of life, from simple to complex. It brings paleontology fully in agreement with the concept of population genetics and the importance of adaptation, uh, gene flow, and the definition of a species of the biological species concept. Now, let's focus on how this plays out in nature with a, a hypothetical species. All right, this species is a simple round dot, which currently occupies a really wide geographic range. The individuals in the north live in a more wet climate and tend to exhibit more blue members, while the individuals in the south tend to live in a more dry climate 
and tend to exhibit more red members. Individuals can interbreed with each other, but since geographic proximity is important, the ratio of red to blue individuals varies with latitude. All right, we're going to highlight one area as our fossil basin or fossil outcrop from which we can sample fossils. For reasons of preservation, other portions of the geographic range are not preserved in the fossil record. So here we can have our ratio down here, and we have more red dots than we have blue dots in our basin here that we're sampling. Now let's imagine that there is a geogra geographic isolating event, such as a new mountain range or a large river that ma now makes it more difficult for, um, for the individuals in the north to mate with individuals in the south and vice versa. Now the population in the north is much smaller and as such quickly loses the red phenotypes from the population while the larger population in the south continues to have both red and blue individuals but at a low ratio. The blue individuals are pretty rare and since they are mixing with the greater population of red individuals there's little to select for them to become dominant. While the northern population is exclusively blue and very specialized to a wet climate. Now let's imagine that the isolating barrier is lost and the climate becomes wetter favoring the northern population. Nearly instantly these northern invaders pool into the south and very quickly shifting the ratio of red and blue right down here. Note that this could represent a new species if the red individuals didn't interbreed with the new blue invading individuals or a sudden shift in the observed populations of a single species. Note that this, these sudden shifts or punctuations occur during times in which the environment changes or when barriers of gene flow are removed such as shifts in sea level or changes in the climate. All right, so now let's look at another example. Imagine a population of purple and green dots. The green dots tend to be more common to the north where they overlap with a predator that eats them. And these are illustrated by the X's here. The purple dots are easy to see and as such they're eaten more frequently. The southern populations have no such fears and the purple dots are as common as green dots in the population. There's an, there's an isolating barrier that exists to keep those predators just to the north. But this allows for interbreeding of individuals in both areas. However, imagine that that barrier for that predator is actually removed. Come down into the south, where they easily find food in the abundant purple dots. Hence, very quickly, again, the ratio of green and purple dots changes within a few generations. Most of the population is green now. Thus, many mechanisms can explain these abrupt changes, which tend to be the normal expression of the fossil record. If you're really interested in a detailed examination of evolutionary processes from the point of view of paleontology, I highly recommend reading Niles Eldridge's Eternal Ephemera, Adaptation and the Origin of Species from the 19th Century through Punctuated Equilibrium and Beyond which was recently published in 2015, and Stephen Jay Gould's The Structure of Evolutionary Theory, published in 2002. They're both up-to-date accounts of the study of evolution from the perspective of the fossil record and the two strong advocates for this theory. They both go into much more detail than I can provide in this lecture video on that long path of the final near acceptance of punctuated equilibrium as a scientific theory. If you're interested in this lecture and want to take a class with Utah State University, check out our website, uh, the Geology Department website at geology.usu.edu. And if you're interested in who I am and some of my research, check out my website at benjamin Thanks for watching.